So with our Python implementation, the analytical solutions, we've seen that um, uh, how the error behaves uh, for our finite difference calculations. We have, we've seen weird phenomena, like uh, um, a Gaussian pulse is disintegrating into, uh, into a longer uh, waveform, what we call uh, dispersion. We also saw the solution exploding. Now, um, how can we explain that? Uh, from a mathematical point of view. Um, the nice thing about the finite difference method is it's actually possible to, to basically predict these things uh, mathematically, and that's based on the so-called von Neumann analysis. John von Neumann was a, a, a brilliant physicist uh, mathematician, uh, one of the founding fathers of uh, quantum mechanics, game theory, and also uh, uh, scientific uh, computation or, or computer theory. Uh, he was of Hungarian origin, and uh, so his analysis of, uh, of numerical approximations is so fundamental, it's uh, quite a bit of math, but uh, at this point I really think we should go through this uh, derivation once, because it leads to one of the most fundamental results that will be relevant for all the other numerical methods that we will encounter later. So the, for the von Neumann analysis we will make use of uh, plane waves. Uh, in using complex notation. So I hope you have some familiarity with complex numbers. But let's uh, start simple and uh, look at the Euler equation, uh, which relates uh, basically the exponential function to the trig trigonometric functions cosine and sine. So e to the ix is cosine x plus i sine x. And equivalently, uh, for negative x, e to the minus i x is cosine open bracket minus x plus i sine open bracket minus x. And because of the symmetry behavior of, of cosine, this is equal to cosine x minus i sine x. This has important consequences, uh, and we will make use of this later if you add up e to the i x plus e to the minus i x, which you is easy to see, is equal to two times uh, cosine x. So uh, basically, the real cosine x is equal to one over two open bracket e to the i x plus e to the minus i x. You can do the same with uh, for actually you get the definition for a sine x by taking the difference between e to the i x minus e to the minus i x is equal to 2 i sine x. And by that you have a definition of the sine function. Sine x is equal to 1 over 2 i open bracket e to the i x minus e to the minus i x. Before we dive into the uh, uh, discrete version of the acoustic wave equation on numerical approximation, let's have a look again at the uh, uh, acoustic wave equation in the continuous form. Just the second derivative uh, in time of p equals a c square, and the second times the second derivative uh, with respect to space of p, and we omit the source term. Now uh, let's recall the definition of plane waves. Uh, that's p of x t is equal to e to the i open bracket k x minus omega t with k the wave number and omega uh, the temporal frequency. Now with this trial solution we can enter the, the wave equation and it's very easy to calculate the uh, second derivative with respect to time. That uh, turns out to be um, minus omega square e to the i k x minus omega t. And in space, it's uh, uh, with a similar easy calculation. The second derivative with respect to x of p is uh, minus k square e to the i kx minus omega t. Now, if we put that, uh, those uh, de derivative, uh, analytical derivatives into the wave equation, we end up on the left hand side with minus omega square and the exponential. Uh, uh, term is equal to c square k square e to the uh, to, e to the i k x minus omega t, and because uh, the exponential term is always uh, positive, we can basically uh, cancel it out, and we are left with c equals omega by k, which is the the very well known result relating um, uh, the temporal frequency to the wave number, or in other words, the wavelength uh, to the period. That's a dispersion relation, uh, and that gives us basically the condition uh, under which 
uh, waves will propagate. But what happens if we're not in a continuous world, but in our discrete world with our uh, finite difference approximation to the acoustic wave equation? Now, let's recall uh, our discretization of space and time. We defined x to be j dx, where j is an integer, dx is our space increment, and equivalently time is n dt, where n is an integer, and dt is our time increment. Now, it's very simple. We can uh, introduce this definition into our uh, plane wave uh, definition, but now it's not p is not a function of x and t, but p basically has, uh, as we know, upper lower index uh, n and j, and now is equal to e to the i open bracket k j dx minus omega n dt. And this is basically our discrete definition um, of, uh, of plane waves. So remember that in our finite difference approximation to the wave equation, we have terms uh, p of x plus dx, uh, p of uh, x minus dx, and how do we uh, uh, formulate that in, in this uh, plane wave notation? Well, it's actually very simple. For example, uh, p and j plus 1, which would be a point x plus dx, would then be e to the i, open brackets k, now we open another bracket, j plus 1, uh, close bracket dx, minus omega n dt. And uh, uh, we can, of course, it's, it's a, a simple relation, extract e, e to the i k dx from this uh, exponential uh, a term, uh, multiplying then e to the i kx, uh, uh, or basically the discrete version of e to the i k uh, x minus omega t. The same works for the point uh, j minus 1 in an equivalent form. So you have p of j minus 1 n is equal to e to the power of minus i k dx e to the um, uh, kx minus omega t in, in uh, uh, discrete form. Of course, it applies equally well to the uh, discrete time. So, for example, pj n plus 1 would correspond to a uh, t plus dt term uh, is equal to e to the minus omega dt multiplying the uh, standard definition of a plane wave in discrete form. So, basically, now we're ready to, uh, to use these uh, um, new expressions and enter with them into the uh, finite difference approximation of the acoustic wave equation. So that you see here. On the left hand side, uh, we replace uh, the finite difference term with the exponential terms, and we've already ex uh, extracted the basic uh, plane wave uh, uh, definition, and we end up with e to the uh, i kx minus omega dt, uh, in discrete form, open brackets, now e to the i omega dt minus 2 plus e to the minus i omega dt divided by dt square on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we have the square velocity and the equivalent second derivative uh, form uh, based on the plane wave uh, solution, multiplying again the fundamental plane wave solution um, on the right-hand side, without source term. So let's continue modify that equation. We first uh, basically divide the equation on both sides with e to the i k x minus omega t in discrete form. Then we're left with, on the left-hand side, e to the i omega dt plus e to the minus i omega dt minus 2 equals the c square dt square by dx square, open bracket e to the i k dx plus e to the minus i k dx minus 2. So, uh, of course, we need to get rid of these uh, um, imaginary units. And now we go back and use the definition of uh, cosine. So cosine x is equal to 1 half open bracket e to the ix plus e to the minus ix. 
And as you can easily see, if we inject that definition into the equation, we're left with, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, with 2 cosine omega dt minus 2. On the right-hand side, with c squared dt squared by dx squared, open bracket, 2 cosine k dx minus 2. We can divide the whole equation by 2. Um, and uh, and as, as you see, we're left with this uh, the following term. So to continue, we need another definition, another trigonometric relation uh, that's given here, which basically uh, sine x over 2 is equal to plus minus square root of um, 1 minus cosine x divided by 2. Uh, so in other words, 2 sine uh, square x over 2 is equal to 1 minus cosine x, and you can already see that this will dramatically simplify the uh, equation that we've uh, derived. So we end up with, um, on the left-hand side, sine square, open bracket, omega dt over 2, is equal to c square dt square by dx square, multiplying sine square k dx over 2. We can take uh, uh, the square root of this equation, and we end up uh, with a relation of two sine functions, sine omega dt over 2, is equal to c dt by dx sine k dx over 2. And this uh, simple equation uh, basically leads to one of the most fundamental results of uh, uh, numerical analysis. So we see that we're relating two sine functions, and uh, in the middle there is the term c times dt by dx. So in order for this equation to have uh, real solutions, c times dt by dx has to be smaller equals 1. And that condition is the famous Kumar Friedrich Levy criterion, often referred to as the CFL criterion for numerical analysis. Basically, it's the relation of two velocities, the physical velocity in the, in the, in the medium where we're propagating waves, and we have the dx by dt, which is kind of a grid velocity relating the grid increment divided uh, to the uh, time increment dt. We cannot overstate this uh, result, uh, c times dt by dx smaller than 1 in our case, which uh, in, mo in more general terms is uh, smaller than epsilon. Epsilon can be something around 1, can be smaller, can be larger. It depends on the uh, dimensionality of the problem and also on the specific numerical method. So basically because our space increment dx is usually imposed by the physical problem that we want to solve, um, the time step that we is, is required for a stable solution is basically derived uh, from the Courant criterion. But another important message is that um, a stable solution does not mean it's accurate. As we've seen, we had stable solutions, we found numerical dispersion. So that's a very important point to, um, to know whether your solution is accurate uh, you have to co either compare with analytical solutions or uh, do some convergence test, and that's something we will uh, encounter later. So can we make use of this von Neumann plane wave analysis to understand what we've observed in our Python implementation of the finite difference uh, approximation to the acoustic wave equation? We saw numerical, we saw dispersion, which is not predicted by, uh, by the analytical solution. So let's have a look again at the final result, where we had uh, uh, the two sine terms on both sides of the equation connected by c times dt by dx. So let's extract omega on the left-hand side, uh, making use of the uh, inverse sine function, the arc, a sine function, uh, and that uh, allows us to come up basically now with a the temporal frequency as a function of the physical velocity and the, our discretization schemes, uh, dt and dx. So if we divide both sides of that equation by wave number k, we now basically have uh, a phase velocity, c equals omega by divided by k, but as you can easily see, uh, this time, 
the, uh, the phase velocity actually depends on the discretization scheme. There is one special situation, and that's basically if uh, c times dt divided by dx is equal to 1. You can easily see if you, uh, and under that situation, you basically exactly recover the analytical solution. But that's a kind of an academic case because, of course, we're doing numerical solutions because the, uh, we want to have uh, space-dependent uh, velocities. You have a complex model. So in reality, that uh, actually will not really help us. But that's a, a very special situation. But now let's try to understand what this equation really means. So let's try to understand the consequences of a result by looking at the sampling theory. Um, so that allows us to basically come up with the an analytical solution of the wave speeds as a function of our discretization scheme. What's the minimal wavelength uh, we can uh, describe in a, when we have a discretization in, in dx, or regular, a regular grid in dx in one dimension? That's actually the Nyquist wavelength, 2 times dx. And in terms of wave number, wave number is uh, 2 pi by, by lambda. It's 2 pi by lambda, um, the Nyquist wavelength, this is pi by dx. So uh, we can go back to that equation that we just derived, which is the, um, the phase velocity as a function of, of dx and dt, and basically um, uh, come up with a graph that shows the phase velocity as a function of number of grid points per wavelength. And that's shown here. The true velocity, the true physical velocity is 2 kilometers per second. And we see that if, uh, if we start at the, on the left-hand side with uh, very few grid points per wavelength, 2, 3, 4, 5, we see that actually we do not recover the proper physical velocity. The velocity is smaller. If we use more and more points, we converge to the true physical velocity. And that's actually what we saw in our simulations. Um, we injected a Gaussian shape and uh, that waveform disintegrated and we were left with a, a, a tail, the energy that actually came later because, and we now know why, um, had smaller energy that was uh, traveling a smaller velocity. And actually for all numerical solutions, particularly for wave propagation problems and many other problems too, this kind of... Uh, Numerical dispersion has to be avoided by all means. In other words, we have to find an appropriate discretization scheme that leads to uh, an, an accurate representation of the velocity um, in our physical model, whether that's a, a model of the atmosphere or a model of the Earth. That's an, a very important aspect to consider for all numerical simulations. So let's look at another aspect of this von Neumann analysis. Remember, in the original introduction of the definition for the finite difference, um, that if dx, the space increment, uh, converges to zero, we recover the analytical um, uh, result for, for the derivative. Now, we can pose the same question, basically, for, the, for our analytical um, analysis of our finite difference approximation for plane waves. What happens if dt and dx goes to zero? Are we actually recovering the, um, the analytical result? Now for that we make use of a very simple relationship for the sign, or um, if, if x sine x, if x equals small. We know that sine of x equals x uh, for a very, very small x. So as you can see here, if dt and dx uh, become smaller, this condition can be uh, applied. And you see what happens. Uh, if we let dx and dt get smaller and smaller, all these terms cancel each other out in this equation, and we actually recover uh, c equals omega by k, which is the actual true physical velocity. And that shows basically that our, uh, our numerical scheme is convergent, uh, meaning that if uh, our increments become smaller and smaller, we uh, converge to the analytical solution of our problem. And that's a very, very important result.